What's up, punks? Uh, this is a special edition of Block Digest with guests uh, Nicholas Gregory and uh, Tom Trevithan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right from yeah, uh, Commerce good. Block. <laughs> so how are you guys doing today? Very good, thank you. Yeah, good. Cheers. So uh, today we're probably going to be doing a lot of talking about uh, tokens, uh, securities, you know, all those things Bitcoin maximalists love to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, to kind of start, you, you guys have the uh, Ocean platform, which is based on Elements. Um, do you guys want to kind of go into a little bit about, uh, you know, what you're kind of trying to do there and maybe some of the, the high level design choices you guys made versus something like Liquid? Yeah, I guess uh, when, when we started, we've been kind of working on the sidechain space for a while. Uh, Liquid wasn't really live or available. It was just Elements. So we started looking at the, the we had a, basically a client who wanted to do some sort of tokenized gold. And we, we had experience uh, using pay to contract because uh, we were the authors of Bit175. And this was around 2017, uh, I think. And really the only options at the time were using something like, sorry, was using something like, um, um, who are you looking at? the Tether option, the kind of omni-layer stuff. And, you know, we kind of looked at uh, elements at the time, but that was kind of very raw. So we basically had to fork it to introduce a lot of the kind of the KYC requirements and kind of like the stuff we had to do around um, securing it against the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's where kind of mainstay came about. And that was kind of like an attempt to build a single seal set, which had been discussed many times by uh, Peter Todd. Yeah, so, so I mean, the... The, basically the, the model was that so we wanted we wanted to well we chose elements we wanted to use the you know the the robustness of like the, the bitcoin utxo um architecture and uh so we but we were required i mean a client we had wanted to to launch this gold token and, and they had a requirement for uh like a kyc layer um so we uh, did quite a lot of work adding that into the elements um, and we kind of had to fork elements I mean some substantial changes mainly at the the, the kind of policy uh, layer um, and yeah so so this was the the history of, of us kind of using elements um, so we uh, also I mean the I, I guess it's good to kind of go in about bit about our kind of model and the way that we go about things, which is different from, say, Liquid. So Liquid is a, 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 a side chain. Um, we're not, um, we don't have a side chain. This is not our kind of model. We basically have a model that each asset and each issuer who wants to issue a token has their own uh, blockchain which is obviously completely centralized, uh, is permissioned so that they can add in all kind of, you know, any kind of policy restriction, any kind of uh, KYC that they need to. Um, but that the, but that these are permission, but public, uh, asset backed blockchains. Um, but the immutability is guaranteed by Bitcoin. So we had this, we have this mainstay, uh, protocol where we can, basically use Bitcoin's immutability. Um, and so, yeah, so, so it's a very different kind of model than, than Liquid. So Liquid is is trying to be, well, aside from its uh, like role as a, a real Bitcoin sidechain for moving Bitcoin around in a, in a lower fee, kind of um, more private uh, environment. Uh, Liquid for like issued assets is trying to be a single platform that everyone can just issue their assets on so so our model is a bit different that we have individual chains for individual asset issuers and so they can maintain control um, and ownership of that um, so yeah that's I guess a bit of a quick summary yeah okay you know I think there's a couple things uh, in there I kind of want to touch on but I think 
mainstay would probably be uh, what makes the most sense. I think that's kind of like the, the biggest uh, differentiator in terms of the consensus layer. So did you kind of want to break through or break down? I mean, um, like how mainstay works and kind of how the architecture is set up to guarantee that you can find like a single canonical state for things. Okay. So, so the basic idea of mainstay is that you exploit the, the uniqueness of a, a Bitcoin UTXO. This is like Peter Todd's um, single use seal uh, idea. Um, so essentially you're using the fact that there's only a, only that the, the UTXO in Bitcoin is, is completely unique. The transaction ID is completely unique. And therefore a sequence of transactions or a chain of transactions in Bitcoin is also completely unique. And you can prove that there's only a single history of a given sequence of transactions. Um, so it's essentially it's exploiting that property by committing a separate chain, so it's a separate blockchain or a separate side chain, and committing the history of that separate blockchain into this sequence of transactions on Bitcoin. Um, and then by, by verifying the Bitcoin blockchain and verifying the uniqueness of this sequence of transactions, you can also verify that the history of this sidechain or separate blockchain is also unique. Um, it's kind of, there is a second step that you also need to prove that there's only a single history because this is a bit different from just like timestamping. So if you think about it, you could timestamp anything into Bitcoin, but that doesn't guarantee uniqueness. It doesn't guarantee yeah. that there's a single history because you could timestamp two alternative uh, you know, sequence of states into Bitcoin. Um, yeah, it's a, like then, a data withholding attack. Like I yeah, can keep yeah. my my parallel history secret and then just drop it out there later and confuse everything. Yeah, or just you know give one history to one set of people, another history to another set of people, and uh, double spend. Um, so this this preserving this uniqueness it was it was the main aim of this. Um, and so in order to do that to to ensure that there was only a single uh, history possible you also have an additional rule that you have to commit this um, Bitcoin UTXO into the side chain. So essentially you start off with a transaction in a single transaction in, in Bitcoin, you commit that transaction ID into the kind of Genesis block of your side chain, and then you propagate this chain of transactions on Bitcoin. Every time you create a new transaction, you commit the state of the side chain into that, uh, transaction and then you continue going on this and then you can independently verify that there's uh, only a single history is possible for the side chain um, this is kind of highly it has to be centralized you have to have someone has to be uh, controlling the keys to these outputs on Bitcoin um, so you know you basically are trusting someone to perform the commitment to keep going. But once the commitment is done, uh, you can kind of, with a level of trustlessness, you can verify that there is only a single history. So it's kind of permissioned, uh, essentially. Um, but this, then, but then again, this, this side chain is permissioned as well. So you have a centralized entity, which is uh, signing blocks on the side chain. Um, and this entity could also be responsible for propagating this sequence of transactions on, on Bitcoin. Um, so we added a few things to try and improve this. So you can have like, um, you know, some kind of multi-sig uh, for the Bitcoin transaction chain. So you could, if you've got like a federated side chain, you can have the same rules, uh, the same permissions uh, propagating this uh, uh, chain of transactions on, on Bitcoin. Um, we also use a uh, pay to contract, um, which saves a bit on transaction fees. Uh, yeah. Do you actually want to explain that for people who might not uh, know what that is? I'm not sure that's like one of the most widely known bits. Yeah. So most people, when they want to commit 
data into to Bitcoin for timestamping or whatever. These op return. So an op return is a, a provably prunable um, output. So you can add a special output where you can commit data to that isn't included in the UTXO set. Um, though there is some contention about op returns. There's been the, the size of the op return allowed has changed over time. Um, and some people aren't in favor of having op returns because uh, they think it encourages people to <laughs> abuse Bitcoin in, in the way we're doing. Um, so, uh, and also it makes transactions larger. So there's an alternative in that you can actually uh, commit to data, which is kind of embedded in the actual address that you use to, to pay an output mm -hmm. to. Um, so the way, an easy way to explain this, I guess, is that you, you can modify the, the public key that you pay to in a particular way that you can later prove that a particular cryptographic commitment was added to that public key. Um, so it basically so like, uh, uh, like tweaking with sure. Yeah, you're tweaking yeah. the, the, the word, you know, so you kind of tweak, you have a public key that you're going to pay to you tweak the public key, you then hash it to an address, you pay to that address, and then you can independently prove that you made that commitment. Um, you can reveal the commitment at a later stage. So this, yeah, it's a bit more efficient than not okay. return. And the mind okay, of the I think here. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. It's just about it's like here's uh, I think a good point. Uh, I think for me to play devil's advocate a little bit. <laughs> so, like the the one of the the only issues that I, I kind of took when I first uh, saw this whole platform. Um, and, you know, the other one I'll get into in a second was based on a, a misconception on my part. But um, this one is. With when it comes to the using the pay to contract to commit to a, a side chain using mainstay, I think that pay to contract is a very good efficiency gain. Um, you know, like you said, a lot of people aren't fond of, you know, op returns eating up more block space than they need to. But I, I don't really see how it kind of improves the censorship resistance of these mainstay commitments because the, the way that mainstay is structured, it requires there only be a single output in these commitment transactions. So you can only ever add extra inputs that condense down to the single output in each mainstay transaction. And that's a very like abnormal pattern in transactions that kind of stands out. So I, I think it's a big win in terms of the efficiency of chain space, but I, I don't really see how it kind of adds to any kind of meaningful censorship resistance. You know? Yeah, I, bet, I mean, when we um, uh, added that phrase, I think in our paper, that's probably where you read it. Um, the, I think what we were getting at is the fact that, I mean, we, we don't know what the future holds for Bitcoin and there's been lots of contentious things in the past. I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that there is some potential movement in the future, maybe to change, like change the, uh, the policy rules in Bitcoin. Um, I mean, the, the is standard rules, I think, to, to change the size of uh, the op return that was allowed, um, which happened quite a few years ago. Um, so although I don't think it's on the cards, but I think that it's not beyond the realms of possibility that there could be some kind of movement within Bitcoin, uh, maybe to, um, I don't know, a, say eliminate or return from the kind of his standard transaction rules, for example. Okay, so you're not you're not talking like selective minorship uh, or minor not not selective censorship, but it basically by by hiding your commitments, your I think you're removing the possibility that at some point in the future some obviously yeah i don't think miners would selectively uh censor kind of op return transactions but there it, i think it's possible that in the future there might be some campaign or movement which would actually change the the policy rules on, on op return okay so you're just worried about long-term um consensus or protocol changes and kind of future proofing against that yes i think so i think so it kind of makes it a bit more robust in the long term, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. 
And then, you know, the, the other kind of criticism I brought up um, last time, again, you know, this was a misconception on my part, is I did not like the idea of mainstays with the assumption I had that each chain would effectively have its own independent uh, mainstay anchor in the main chain. But uh, talking to, to Nick here a little bit, um, you, you guys are actually aggregating uh, all the member chains under this platform into a single mainstay commitment. Uh, yes, that, that's our that's our kind of service, and that's what we we want to kind of make money from this kind of long term. Uh, obviously, it's anybody's free if they want to maintain control over this, then they would have to do it themselves. But obviously, doing it themselves is not the most efficient way. Also, our well, partly partly the reason we decided to 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 aggregate these and run a service was some of our clients actually don't want to touch Bitcoin. And so they want to, and they don't want to be exposed to the risk of uh, transaction fee kind of volatility. Um, so it was kind of natural for us to think about running this for them. Uh, so we're we're kind of controlling the keys to this main stay stay chain, um, and then we can yeah then we can basically aggregate commitments. Um, I guess I explain a bit why this is slightly different from say like open timestamps and that uh, this only works you only maintain the the guarantee of of a single history um that that same kind of guarantee of immutability if the commitment uh, from any particular sidechain uh, goes into the same position in this merkle tree uh, when you uh, compress it to do a single commitment so essentially our model is that we we run this service we have we call them slots and people can pay like a small monthly fee to access this slot um, and that when they're uh, basically sending commitments to this slot that they, they they have exclusive kind of access to the commitments they add to this slot and so by my, by maintaining the sequence of commitments in that slot that they then maintain that kind of guarantee of a single history and of immutability so so this is our plan that we can run this as a service and obviously we try and run it as best we can. So we've taken lots of care over the robustness of the, the, the transaction signing. So we have like a two or three multi-sig output on Bitcoin. All the keys are generated within uh, hardware security modules in Switzerland. <laughs> and so we, you know, cause obviously the, it's a, it's a trust, but verify model. So, if people are going to use this, they have to trust us to, if these keys get lost or stolen, um, then you're going to lose that. You're going to lose that guarantee of, of proving a single history. Essentially, any any sidechain would have to hard fork if we lost those keys. Um, yeah, but that's that's not the end of the world. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's. Like re really, when I first saw this platform, it, it was kind of just my initial read, um, you know, based on incomplete information that this was going to be kind of another thing spamming the the Bitcoin chain. Okay. But you know, looking at what you guys are, are doing, it's you you're really taking, I think, the effort to be efficient with that, and it's I, I have no problem with this kind of stuff as long as there's that striving to be efficient in, in order to not pollute the common. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, of course. When it, uh, we'll see, it's economically, we're economically incentivized to be as efficient as, as possible. Um, I think you know. I guess that the, uh, I mean, uh, you must be quite aware of uh, very block and and their yeah. their model, <laughs> which is a bit different. Yeah, um, I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not necessarily. I don't think it's going to work. I think our model is much more efficient. Um, the the big problem with with Veriblock and they're essentially trying to do the same thing. And in a way it's it has advantages because the, their model is, is, is well, uh, is at least on paper, it's permissionless and it's decentralized. Um, that's why it's so inefficient, I think, with their, with their mechanism. Um, but if you're going to use the Veriblock service, you essentially have to then do full verification of three blockchains. You have to verify Whichever blockchain is being secured by Veriblock, you have to verify the Veriblock blockchain, and then you have to verify the Bitcoin blockchain to get that that proof of, of immutability. 
um, which again is, is very inefficient. Whereas uh, with, with, with our approach, you just verify the sidechain blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, and then a single Merkle proof. So, um, you know, I think you just gave me the perfect end to like the, the last kind of thing I wanted to, to get into on mainstay. I, I didn't really know how to, to transition though. Um, here's the reason why I don't like Veriblock, but I don't have any issues with, with mainstay after really getting to understand it. And that's the, the incentives. Like the, one of my big concerns about this kind of attaching things to the Bitcoin network is you are creating an incentive now to reorganize the Bitcoin chain. Like you are attaching more value dependent on that proof of work for its current state as an incentive to, well, if you reorganize this, you can manipulate this value too. And the reason I don't like Veriblock is because the Veriblock system is attaching public chains, things that can themselves be reorged or double spent. Whereas with Mainstay, you're working with federated environments. So even if like the, that type of reorganization was to happen, one, you don't have access to the federation keys to actually do anything on whatever side chain unless you are the operator. And two, these are ultimately still trust-based assets that in the event of a reorganization like that, everybody can kind of just sit there and go, we're going to ignore this and go with the, the state that was previously good. So you, you're, you kind of have a, a sort of safety cushion from yeah. that type of incentive distortion. I think it's kind of like, we'd like to think of it as a, I mean, it's all about, it, this is something you can put on top of what is a completely trusted system. So, you know, you can say uh, a, a, a blockchain where the issuer basically controls the block production isn't very useful as a blockchain because obviously they can rewrite it at will. Um, but essentially when you're, yeah, I guess, I don't know if we yeah, we'll move on to talking about security tokens and, mm -hmm. Uh, whether, you, whether you trust someone, uh, you know, for example, this this gold token, you know, you trust someone who has the gold in the vault and you're trusting that they're going to give the gold back to you when you go to redeem it. Um, and if they're just running their own blockchain, uh, they can rewrite that blockchain at will. Um, but so, but you do have some, uh, you know, you, essentially, yeah, they're, they're, they're producing the blocks and so you're trusting them to do that. So this mainstay essentially is just laid on top of that. So it gives you, a, as, a, as a token holder, it gives you an additional, um, basically, a, an additional verification that the, the, the operator of this, this blockchain, this asset-backed blockchain, has not rewrited history. So you have some independence, you have some independent proof that, that your ownership is, is, is unique. Yeah. Something that you can take to a, a courtroom or, yeah, or yeah. some kind of arbitration that doesn't have subjectivity to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of, you are, you are exploiting or borrowing Bitcoin's, you know, globally objective state. Um, but this is laid on top of, uh, an, an already should be quite secure, um, you know, uh, set up kind of federated block site. Mm-hmm. And there's actually one more thing I kind of wanted to talk about before we move on to just security tokens in general. Um, your uh, chain cert program. Um, this is actually something I just read about um, over the last week or so. Um, and I actually think this is a pretty interesting way to kind of bring people into the, this web of trust you have to interact with. So would you want to kind of break down, um, you know, how chain cert works and kind of the whole reasoning behind uh, this to go along with the whole platform? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a white paper. I mean, we we have a rough implementation, but I guess when we were working with this, you know, different digital assets, we, we started to realize we're going to have a, an issue down the line where people are not necessarily going to know which asset they have. And, you know, we've already seen this with various versions of Bitcoin. And when, when you're talking about digital assets, we thought that this, this problem could be become a lot worse. So it was a way of basically creating a digital certificate on the bit, but, you know, attesting it to the Bitcoin blockchain, but using that as a way of validating the kind of the digital asset, which we, which we actually, which people actually have. So, yeah, I guess it's like, it's trying to, um, I mean, when you go and buy something, I guess, buy an asset, you, you obviously have to, there's several ways that you, you know that, 
you know what you're getting. Obviously, if it's mm. Bitcoin, you need to make sure, firstly, you've got the Bitcoin software, you've got an authentic wallet, which is, and then you've got, you know, you, you know what the genesis block of Bitcoin should be. Well, you, you, you think you do because it's social consensus what the genesis block is and where you download your software from. But we wanted to, but obviously for, for, for kind of asset backed side chains that you, you don't have that, you have to um, get the information on, on, you know, what is the correct version of this chain and do you actually own that asset or not? Um, and obviously you can do that kind of manually by checking you know, hashes of Genesis blocks and all this kind of stuff. But we wanted to automate this and, and be able to, for, for, for wallets, for example, to be able to authenticate directly that they're connected to the correct asset and that this links to, you know, um, PKI and, and uh, you, know, pub, um, you know, certificates corresponding to websites of asset issuers and things like this. So I think it's quite, yeah, it's definitely going to be needed as these things proliferate. Yeah, so kind of like the the TLS authority for these side chains. Like as long as you have this one root key you can verify from, you can prove this chain is is legitimate, this wallet to go with it is legitimate, and, and all these other um, you know tools in the in the kit you're going to need. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually you know I was really. You know, it was a pleasant surprise to see this kind of thinking because I think this is going to even start to become an issue with Bitcoin itself in the long term. Uh, you know, maybe not issues like the Genesis block, but th there's definitely going to be these kinds of supply chain issues that, that mm -hmm. we're going to have to deal with. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So I guess, uh, you know, let's, let's kind of jump into the whole security token scene. Uh, no, yeah, before we start, the, the, the gold project actually <clears throat> isn't a security token. Um, we're, we're, we're just a technical provider here. It's actually an idea that was from MKS PAMP, which was a, one of the larger uh, gold companies in, in Europe based in Switzerland, and CoinShares. And this is like a joint venture. But one of the key things is that this wasn't a security. It's actually a payment token regulated under the Swiss authorities. And... Yeah, so I just want to make it clear that's not a security, this gold. It's actually yeah. uh, an actual, um, the, the, the token itself is actually re redeemable for physical gold, which is held in a, a vault in Switzerland. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, the, these kinds of platforms are going to definitely yeah. be useful beyond just securities. But, but yeah, um, we started, we actually yeah, had to say... a lot of work making this not a security, yeah. which is interesting in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let, let, let's let's say the token space then. Yeah. Like, you know, how do you guys see, you know, the, this whole kind of space evolving? Because it's it's something a lot of Bitcoiners kind of just shit on the whole idea of a, a token or an equity token or, or whatever it is, because just use a database. But I, I think that's kind of short-sighted in terms of just the the efficiency and the uptime and the interoperability of things. I, I think that there are some benefits there, even though you aren't really removing any any trust here. Well, there's, there's a couple of ways. First of all, we're in the business of building side chains. So funny enough, after we spoke last week, people are coming to us and thinking, could you have a more of a Bitcoin side chain that could be potentially combined with something like Wasabi or Samurai so that you, you mix confidential transactions with, with some sort of coin join. And that's something that we're starting to look at. Obviously, there's challenges in building that legally. But so, you know, our business model really isn't just tokenization. It's actually building side chains and the infrastructure around it. In terms of commodities, of course, we've worked mainly with gold and we've had some preliminary uh, kind of like experiments with with, with with building kind of asset-backed securities. I guess some of the challenges, the regulations don't necessarily meet what you can do because a lot of these securities can only be traded during certain hours. And by putting these on, on blockchains, you essentially can trade these things 24-7. And, you know, I, I come from, uh, I'm, I'm from a software engineering background, but I did work in the finance industry. You do have issues when you're trying to trade something 24-7. Do you have the amount of shares that you believe you have and you know having a blockchain backed by bitcoin kind of answers a lot of these challenges and um, but you know the, the regulations there don't necessarily meet what you can do with a blockchain that's what we're seeing so if you want to but yeah that. i think we you know but we we want to 
obviously at the moment, you know, it's kind of early stages and, and you have to work within the real world. But I think, you know, we our view is that, you know, that a token ownership, as the way I see it, a token is different from just a database entry. Is It's about independent verification of ownership. Um, and that independent verification of ownership enables you to transfer the ownership very easily with a very easy operation and it should enhance the way that people were able to trade with each other if they don't have to go through this uh, you know trusted third party obviously the issuer uh, of, of a, a token which is backed by a commodity or backed by equity or something mm -hmm. um, has to be trusted to to basically return that ownership to you or to, to, to redeem the token. But by everybody being able to own or independently verify their ownership is, is quite a powerful thing. And it can basically enable, yeah, it can enable the kind of peer-to-peer -peer trade of these uh, of these ownership of these assets. Um, and yeah, and it's fundamentally, I think, more valuable than just having your ownership recorded in someone else's database. But to have your ownership being able to independently verify and prove your ownership to anybody else, I think is quite a useful property. Um, probably not as revolutionary as Bitcoin itself, but uh, you know, we, we, we believe that it's, this is a useful technology to exploit and to, to make all kind of uh, you know, ownership and, and being able to transact ownership kind of much more efficient. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, th I think people really underestimate the kind of inefficiencies you get when you have a half dozen intermediaries you have to go through using different databases, like different communication systems that all have to reconcile this before something is considered finalized, as opposed to they're just running a blockchain node and mm -hmm. they see updates. They don't have to be proactively involved in it. Yeah, and if you look at the, the gold project, it essentially makes um, the token look like a bearer asset, even though the gold is ultimately in the vault, but it's it's ultimately, it legally looks and feels like a bearer asset. Whereas if you have gold ETF, I don't know, are there 20, 30 databases between you and the gold? Do you actually have ownership or is it just a series of, you know, kind of promises and wishes and contracts, which is, you know, what you see when you start looking at this space? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, it's it's compressing a lot of the, the middle layers of ownership. So if you can see direct, well, it, so with, with what we did for this, this gold project, you know, you have a wallet um, with a token in it. You own the private key to that token. Um, you can independently verify via digital signatures from the, the vault operators, the individual gold bar you own. You can see how many gold bars everyone owns, and you can guarantee you can also verify that your ownership is unique uh, against Bitcoin. So this is kind of yeah, this is this is enhanced ownership essentially. It's 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 stronger guarantees of ownership than just you know trusting some database behind a web form that that you actually own something. Mm -hmm. And I think it also offers just a lot of massive potential in the derivatives project. I mean, like the, the work uh, Blockstream is doing on forward contracts or discrete log contracts on, on Liquid, like that type of stuff could be done with other assets as well. And you yeah. get the same benefit of the entire supply of whatever this derivative is based on is publicly auditable. You can see what's involved in derivatives, like all it it adds so much more transparency to a useful financial tool that traditionally comes with massive downsides and rooms for manipulation. Is that the yeah. digital garage stuff you're talking about? Is that... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's just like, there's, there's so much massive room to open up, you know, not as much as, as Bitcoin is opening up uh, financial access, but, you know, still to a large degree, opening up access to these markets. I mean, you know, if you have the, a sidechain platform that's not locked down, uh, something like Liquid, like I could just go set up a derivatives contract with anybody willing for anything I want that's, that's tokenized on that platform or denominated with Bitcoin. Like these types of platforms, 
you know, they're very useful because the financial world is not just move money from A to B. There, there's a lot more to it that's built up over the years to really help people manage and shift risk around. And that's going to be just as important to bring, you know, to the 21st century as money. Yeah, sure. definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, you know, th- this whole, you know, th- this whole kind of like side chain space is one thing I- I'm kind of looking at is the, the interoperability in the long term, you know, because you, you guys are building the, this ocean platform um, to pretty much let people spin up their own asset chains. Um, Blockstream is kind of building this this single liquid platform to, to host a number of assets and chains. Like, well, where do you guys see like kind of collaboration and like building towards interoperability going forward? Well, I think when when Blockstream guys obviously when they started the side chains, they, they made elements a separate open source project. So I don't think they ever wanted, I mean, they've been quite open with us. They were hoping that more other people would contribute and that hasn't worked out for various reasons. And yeah, we're, we're kind of like an, a fork. We're probably maybe a year behind yeah. on them, but yeah, we've spoken to Blockstream. We, in the last uh, couple of months, um, you know, we met Adam back at various conferences and we're going to try and, and, and catch up to where they are. And, you know, we're in talks to maybe just be part of elements so yeah, that we're not, it's, but it's, it's a lot of work to do. It's quite complicated as well. Cause I mean, we, we, yeah, we, 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 but I got the opportunity to meet Adam mm-hmm. like a few weeks ago at a conference and, and, and they, there was a, a kind of desire from their side that I think they would prefer it if we actually just, you know, kind of merged back into elements and just had a single elements, which I think would be very nice if it was possible. But I think one of the problems is, I guess, is that when, if you're relying on a, a an open source uh, project, um, it's quite difficult to add in things that you need, <laughs> you know, kind of quickly. Uh, I guess one of the, one of the good things about having your own fork is that you have got complete freedom to kind of add things whenever you want. I mean, I think that's the only concern we'd have about going, adding everything back into elements is that, um, you would kind of yeah you, you may not be able to get things done quickly and there's lots of reviews and for the for the right reason because i you think want the, the, the side on us is to maybe make things modular so maybe kind of like separate out the things we've made and you know they're interested in some of the work we've done like we we forked um electrum so now mm-hmm. we've got like an electrum server and a wallet that will work with elements and but yeah i think that's where we we need to be yeah um, so i think we, we want to collaborate on basically all the interfaces and getting a Kind of, we, we talked to them about, and we have, I think we have an Android wallet as well that yeah, works yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, so yeah. we do want that to be more of a partnership in some way. But the, their model is very yeah. different. I mean, we're not, we don't see ourselves in competition. They're, you know, they, they sell to exchanges. They're more the network. We don't mm. run our own. We run side chains for clients, and we, but we, you know, it's, it's a very different model. I don't see there's, you know, there's room for collaboration. That's been open mm. about. Yeah, and we try and we try and. Um, you know, push back everything we can back into elements that are useful. There's quite a few things we've managed to contribute. Um, although a lot of our stuff is kind of uh, what the most work we've done on is kind of KYC stuff, which <laughs> I think uh, Blockstream don't seem particularly interested in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's hard finding people who can work on this code base as well. I think we're both in that same situation. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you're kind of talking the you know, pretty much the Bitcoin code base. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In some ways worse. <laughs> but um, how, how about like on the, the application layer, you know, and in, in ways you guys can collaborate there? Because like one thing that obviously jumps out at me is uh, atomic swapping between Liquid and these chains or potentially trying to make an easy system for people to peg these assets into Liquid to, you know, have atomic interactions on a single chain and, and that, that kind of like application layer stuff. Yeah. I mean, we, have any, uh... we haven't really had those chats. I mean, we've, we would like a way, I mean, I think if you look at, if you're honest, liquid was obviously designed as some sort of kind of like backbone between multiple exchanges. So obviously we would, it would be in our interest to be able to feed our assets into liquid so that we could reduce the amount of exchange work we could do. 
Yeah. But, you know, I think there's been various challenges, mainly because of the exchanges on that, on that side. I think that's the, the issue. I mean, I, I think we've got the right um, kind of scaling in terms of um, issuing assets and tokens. I think our, our model is the right uh, kind of architecture for, 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 for scale. But I think the big problem that we, we're starting to encounter now is, is basically interoperability and, and integration. So, I mean, it's a big pushback from exchanges if they have to kind of add, if they have to integrate every single chain. I mean, one of the great successes of, you know, ERC-20 on Ethereum, I mean, it's it's a, a scaling nightmare, but it's the ease of use that an exchange can literally mm-hmm. just, is, is already running, uh, you know, already plugged into Ethereum. So for them to, to, to list a new token, or like a new ERC-20 token is just flicking a switch. And same on Liquid as well, for them to add a, a new issued asset on Liquid. Um, but for our model, it's it's more of a technical hurdle that they have to you know run a node for this uh, separate asset. So this is, I think, where we need to focus a lot of our t- attention on is, is, and maybe, yeah, working more closely with Liquid and, and getting assets peg- pegged into Liquid would be kind of... Uh, and yeah, and some a lot of people that we talk to don't want to use Liquid because of you know, silly ideas that Tor is evil. Yeah, I think that's one of the issues. Like, again, <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have banned Tor in their environment, so that that kind of creates challenges with Liquid. Yeah, something. a lot of kind of corporate style people uh, wanting to do things, and also like being able to. I mean, obviously, if you you want to to use Liquid, you have to you have to have you know LBTC, which um, is fine for people like us. But I think some of our people we talk to, yeah. that they 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 want to keep the the crypto kind of uh, the actual cryptocurrency at arm's length, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's that's definitely an issue to consider. But I mean, if if you can find some kind of way around that, I mean, Liquid seems like the the perfect way to to deal with that kind of issue. Like just mm-hmm. one chain that the exchanges are already integrating, and that's all they have to worry about. No, groovy. Yeah, no. definitely. And yeah, and then we have people that want to use us as like more of a second layer solution, you know, to basically have a separate side chain, but to peg Bitcoin, but maybe have more privacy features. Because mm. obviously we're on elements and, you know, we support obviously confidential transactions. And there's been talks, would you have some sort of coin join client, etc. cetera? Mm. Yeah, it's something we've done a lot of whiteboard session. How do you run that? Which jurisdiction? What's the, what's the, the image going to be of that? It's a lot of open questions there, but. Yeah, see, that's a, you know, actually, we can get into that before I push us into the Easter egg. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, that's a real interesting discussion, I think, is coin joins on a side chain, because you effectively create like a two layer problem you have to deal with, where the actual peg in and peg out of the, the chain is its own independent anonymity set versus like whatever anonymity set you've built up locally in the chain. And so if you move into the, the side chain and, you know, do your mixing and pull out, you destroy the anonymity set you built in that local environment and kind of reduce yourself to the peg in and peg out. So something like that really needs to kind of consider how they're, they're handling both of those anonymity sets. Like, I think that the most ideal thing would be if, if we wind up having multiple federated side chains pegging Bitcoins in and out, they could cooperate um, and actually coin join their respective withdrawals so that you could obscure even which side chain uh, a withdrawal is being uh, processed from. Oh, yeah, that's quite an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's yeah, lots of quite interesting things you could do there. Because yeah. it's like that, that especially is like, Another factor is the the liquidity. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you have a, a side chain that's only got like a hundred Bitcoin in it, um, and another side chain that has you know ten thousand in it, like the, those are not going to be able to mix really in in, in a beneficial way because <clears throat> you know anything under a certain threshold you can say could be either, but anything over is like no, that's agent A. And mm-hmm. so I think like that kind of thing is. We're, you know, we're going to have to consider like tiers of liquidity or when it comes to mixing, I think, in the long term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. lots of interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of tra- interesting stuff being done you know, at the moment. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a wide open field. Yeah. All right, though. I guess. Uh, are you, you guys ready for some Easter egg fun? <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> so, uh, Tom, how was it like to work with the real Satoshi Nakamomo? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I'd like to separate my ex- experience at Enchain overall, and the thing is, within you know, I, I. I you know, met a lot of nice people there and, and some smart people as well. And, you know, um, I had a, overall, I had a good experience there. I was treated well. Um, the certain person maybe is a different mentor. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't regret, I don't regret working for Enchain at all. I think at the time it was a, a great opportunity to basically, you know, get paid basically to not have to do much and just learn about Bitcoin all day. Um, and I didn't really have to work with Craig, um, at least in the first kind of part of my employment. When I, when I, when I joined Enchain, it was like uh, in 2016, just after the kind of famous uh, public uh, <laughs> reveal. And uh, actually, Craig, Craig wasn't really involved with the, the company much at all then. Um, and Basically, I joined a team of um, researchers and basically all we had to do was like create ideas and they would turn into patents and no one really cared what we did. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great. Um, but then after yeah, after a year or so, they, they started to kind of double down on Craig and he was brought back in a lot more. And that's when it started to get a bit crazier and crazier. Um, so eventually, yeah, eventually it kind of, uh, I left and a lot of other people left, uh, but, um, but yeah, like I said, I don't regret it at all. Um, but yeah, I, uh, as, as for working with Craig, um, he's an interesting guy, uh, he's not, very, <laughs> he's not a very nice man, um, uh, but you know, there were some crazy fun times <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, but I don't regret not working for him anymore. I'm pretty glad I don't work there anymore. Yeah, well, what was that like doing research for them? Because I mean, like, I I've by no means comprehensively crawled through all the patents they've filed, but no, you don't the, the ones that. I have, it's it's like a lot of the things. It, it seemed like just blatantly attempting to patent prior art, like like some of the 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 hierarchical um, key schemes that came out of that read to me like like Enchain was pretty much just trying to patent Diffie Hellman. Yes. To, like, with there's a lot of else. so so there's a huge the, the the kind of patent program. So they'd obviously promised investors like X number of patents and obviously Craig had some stuff. Um uh and so but our our kind of our the the research team basically was allowed to work independently so we could kind of do our own thing um but yeah a lot of it was just kind of nonsense and and you'd kind of uh you know lawyers would basically push things through um and you know it's yeah it was all a bit crazy i mean some stuff that might have been good i think part of the frustration that we had um was that you would never know so you would, you know, you were, you were basically asked to come up with ideas um, to patent things. So you'd write a white paper, you'd then, um, uh, you know, kind of it would be sent to the patent lawyers and they would come back with a, a, a pattern. Um, but the frustration, I think, was that you, you weren't quite sure whether these were good ideas or not, because there's no real kind of peer review. Um, but yeah, I don't think a lot of what was pushed through especially from a certain person <laughs> was, uh, was kind of, yeah, uh, a lot of, yeah, rehashed stuff. And again, if you, you kind of pay patent lawyers enough, they can kind of rehash anything to anything else. Um, but yeah, I think that, to be honest, I think there's some things that, that we, we worked on, um, while we were there that might've been interesting and valuable. Um, but I guess it's just lost in a big pile of um, unknown, really. So yeah, I wouldn't waste too much time <laughs> going through the whole of the, uh, the 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 output. But you never know; there might be some some bits and pieces in there. Probably, yeah, unlikely from 
Mr. Right. But, you know. <laughs> that, that was actually the next thing I wanted to ask. Like, is there anything you worked on there that you can talk about that you think might actually produce a useful kernel for something? Well, there's... <sighs> So, I mean, obviously, the, the most of the things that I've worked on were are now were kind of published. Um, there, but then again, it's it's kind of quite it's mixed emotions because things that I worked on that I kind of think might be useful and that I'm quite proud of, but then again, you're not quite sure if you want to publicise that, given that who owns the the rights to the patent. Um, although I think a lot of these patents probably aren't very enforceable um, just by their nature. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, there's a few things. I mean, uh, we actually, part of the, um, the kind of, yeah, partly why, how I got involved with Commerce Block was through, you know, kind of contacts. But one of the things that I initially worked on at Enchain was, um, uh, a, uh, we, we were working on trying to do, yeah, develop like two way pegs and two way pegs between one of the thing, one of the ideas that we came up with is a two way peg between a, a proof of work chain and a proof of stake chain using like threshold signatures. Um, I think that was quite interesting. Um, another one, uh, is, was basically this kind of like what is now known as like state chains idea. Um, that you can have this kind of off-chain uh, transfer by uh, basically, yeah, by essentially, yeah, moving the uh, the the ownership of the of a particular output without changing the key, um, yeah, and some and other other bits and pieces. Um, I really got into. I mean, it was because we were given so much freedom. You could kind of go into what you want. So I spent a lot of my time really getting into kind of um, you know privacy stuff zero knowledge proofs, you know, uh, really getting into understanding kind of how, you know, kind of ZK snarks work and stuff like this and bulletproofs. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, to, to be honest, I think a lot of the stuff we came up with was probably, you know, not that kind of revolutionary, but I think there was the frustration. Yeah. was that you, you, these are the kind of ideas that if you could, you know, engage with the community, you would find out quickly, you know, you'd get Greg Maxwell telling you this was bullshit. Um, but you couldn't do that. So you had no idea, like, if these these things were kind of good and valuable or not. Um, I guess that's one of the frustrations. Also, the fact that it never really, it seemed like it was never going to go anywhere. So, um, you know, you, you want to, uh, you want to see, if you come up with an idea, you want to see something, you know, happen with it not just it be kind of filed away into this big pile of patents, which, you know, <laughs> uh, have questionable futures. Uh, so that was a big frustration, yeah. And that's why I wanted to kind of do something a bit more applied. I wanted to actually get involved with the, the, the dirty work of actually implementing something, getting something working, so you can actually you know, see the result of something. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask uh, if you had any funny stories involving Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, probably ones that, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to get in legal trouble. <laughs> um, obviously having signed NDAs and things. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I had, Craig can be funny and entertaining. Um, but, uh, yeah, overall, uh, yeah, I, he, I, I saw that. Yeah. So there's some things I, I don't think I can uh, say, uh, but yeah, some, uh, interesting incidents. Um, but yeah, I, I can't really go into it. I'm afraid, but yeah, I'll say that okay, fair I, enough. Don't, I, mean, I... I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't regret kind of, um, uh, I don't regret kind of meeting him and knowing him, but uh, I don't also regret not having to <laughs> deal with him anymore. Mm -hmm. Don't know how else to more diplomatically put that. 
Well, I, I don't blame you for, for covering yourself, uh, <laughs> considering where you guys are based. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. Not, we're not desperate for the publicity or court action. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. We'd rather be um, known for like other stuff, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm pretty much uh, all plumbed out of uh, questions to ask. I mean, are there any uh, you know last things you guys want to mention or you know, anything you want to put in front of people's eyes maybe they'll go dig and read a little deeper no i mean we're pretty open everything's on our site i mean our github is pretty open and uh, yeah thanks for having us it's, it's fun really yeah yeah thanks a lot it's uh, yeah we I, we do we, we love your show uh, oh, always, uh always always watch or listen rather so yeah yeah thanks mm-hmm. Yeah, not a problem. Hopefully we can get you guys back on, uh, you know, next time you have some major development. For sure. Cool. So All right. Well, uh, punks, I hope you all enjoyed this and we will catch you all next time. Adios. Bye. Yes. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head.